Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Tammy Clifford, CADIS Chief Scientist and Vice President of Evid Evidence Standards. And I would first like to begin by acknowledging the Algonquin Nation, whose traditional and unceded territory we are gathered upon today. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the latest talk in the Cadeth Lecture Series. Now in its fifth year, the Cadeth Lecture Series lets people from across the country and around the globe, Matt, uh, to hear directly from prominent scholars and opinion leaders about pressing issues facing healthcare and health technology assessment. Over 500 people are registered for today's talk, and it's easy to understand why, because gene therapy is currently one of the hottest topics in healthcare. Gene therapy involves inserting corrective genes designed in a lab into the genetic material of a patient's cells to treat a genetic disease. In fact, more than treat, gene therapies are often being touted as cures. And certainly, gene therapies have provided some promising results for patients with blood malignancies, including but not limited to the use of chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, or CAR-T. Our guest today is Dr. Matthew Seftel, Head, Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology, Cancer Care Manitoba, and an Associate Professor at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Seftel is a physician with clinical training in internal medicine, hematology, and blood and marrow transplantation. Using CAR-T as the most prominent example of gene therapy, Dr. Seftel will provide an introduction to gene therapy and to blood and marrow transplantation. He'll also summarize the available data about CAR-T therapy and outline the clinical, economic, and regulatory changes and challenges associated with CAR-T and other gene therapies. The talk will take about 40 minutes, followed by questions from our in-person and online audience. Online participants can ask their questions at any time through the live stream player. And in-person participants should turn on their microphone once they have been recognized so that people online can hear. I also want to remind you that this is a social media friendly event. You're encouraged to tweet and to follow tweets using the hashtag Cadeth Talks. And now, please join me in welcoming one of Cadeth's experts in gene therapy, Dr. Matthew Seftel. Uh, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Uh, it's my privilege to be speaking to this audience, both in person as well as many people who've linked in uh, through electronic means, uh, including from some, some, some transatlantic uh, participants, which I'm, I'm very flattered to hear about. Um, so I'll go through my slides and uh, prevent some, show you some um, introductory uh, objectives for starters. And I've somewhat uh, intentionally chosen a rather sensationalist title for this gene therapy, a scientific renaissance. Notice it does end in a question mark, uh, which means there should be something to answer, uh, in part uh, by myself and, and by, by the participants as, as well as what form of a renaissance is this and whether it truly is a renaissance. And so this is where I spend a, a lot of my day. So on the left is the cancer facility um, at, in Manitoba called Cancer Care Manitoba. It's linked to the University of Manitoba, but as a clinician who's involved in blood and marrow transplant and cellular therapy, it's important to remember that general hospitals are quite important in terms of the complexity of care that's required and a lot of the supportive care that's required. And so I've chosen to show you a picture of the Health Sciences Center in Winnipeg, because this is certainly not just the domain of oncologists, uh, but the domain of many other areas of medicine and science. Uh, just as a reminder of some conventional definitions of the Renaissance, um, this, is, this is not a picture of, of Manitobans, by the way. Um, th this is a somewhat more, more dated rendition of the European Renaissance, and I just pulled up these definitions, which I think maybe don't quite hit the spot, but certainly have the right implications about the discussion today. A movement or period of vigorous artistic and intellectual activity. Um, and, and perhaps 
um, in, a, in a more concrete way, a revival or of renewed interest in something, and in this case, gene therapy. So those are all, I think, quite appropriate definitions, and I'll zero in on some of the, the facts and, and some of my own opinions about this in a moment. Here are my disclosures, and these are important disclosures, is that I've been involved in offering scientific advice to companies that have specific proprietary interests in CAR-T therapy at the bottom there. And I'm also a co-participant in a BioCan RX project uh, that's based out of Ottawa and the Ottawa Health uh, Hospital Research Institute uh, in terms of developing their own CAR-T products here in Canada. And so here are four objectives that I'll try to run through in the next 40-odd minutes. I'll give you a brief history of gene therapy. I'll explain the rationale behind CAR-T therapy or CART therapy. Um, I'll run through some important clinical outcomes, including some risks related to the treatment. And then I do want to have a Canadian-specific focus as well and talk about where Canada fits in. So this was a slide that was lent to me by a colleague of mine who is actually a radiologist at the University of Manitoba, Sandor Demeter. And I think what's important is a reminder that deciding on the introduction of a new policy, and particularly a, a new therapeutic in the world of medicine, is that multiple lenses are applied uh, at various time points before something becomes its final image and the standard result that's launched across a country or for that matter a province or a hospital. It seems very tidy here. There's some epidemiology, efficacy, effectiveness, etc., and all the other layers before big decisions get made. Um, I don't think they're necessarily always as linear and as orderly as this, but my disclosure is that really I'm most capable of speaking about these first three areas, the disease epidemiology, the efficacy of treatments, and the effectiveness of treatment. But the important part of this early discussion, which has participants from various fields, including the public, various fields of science, the media, and other areas, is that this is generally a joint responsibility before very exciting, potentially expensive new therapeutics become a reality, is that these multiple lenses do need to fall in place. There's no way I'm going to be able to manage all of these lenses today. So I'm going to just focus on the first three. So the history of gene therapy is a fascinating one. Um, and I have very little time to talk about it, so I just picked out some key points. The definition that you already heard from Dr. Clifford, the introduction using a vector of nucleic acids, and nucleic acids generally representing DNA or RNA, into cells, and in this case, human cells, uh, with the intent of altering gene expression to prevent, halt, or reverse a pathologic process. And how do we do this? So these are the, 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 cat, the, the categories of approaches, either by gene addition, which would be by replacing a mutated gene with, with, with a non-mutated or a healthy form of that gene, um, gene correction, in other words, editing an abnormal gene, or, uh, in, at least in theory, by gene knockdown, by taking, for example, a defective gene or an overfunctioning gene and um, inactivating it. So these are the general principles. On the whole, I think I'm going to focus most of the discussion about gene addition today. And gene addition today um, would be best represented by, by the most visible example of gene therapy, and that of CAR-T therapy. And so how do you get these genes in? Now, I'm, I'm not a geneticist, um, so I've borrowed a rather beautiful image from a, a, a true geneticist, Dr. Cynthia Dunbar, who published this lovely review last month in, in Science. Um, there are many types of vectors that can uh, transduce human cells. And there's a long history of a variety of viruses and other means that have been chosen to get the desired material into a human cell. For practical purposes, in the green and in the purple are really the, the most frequently used viral vectors 
that allow the transduction of genetic material into human cells, either adeno-associated viruses, uh, which are particularly useful for introducing uh, genes into mature, non-dividing cells, examples being the liver cell or a muscle cell. Um, and what I'm going to be speaking about a little bit more in detail are lentiviral vectors. So these are a group of viruses belonging to the retrovirus family, um, uh, common naturally occurring viruses. They have already been modified to remove their pathogenic, their disease-causing genetic characteristics, and their replication potential has also been removed such that they are able to um, infect a human, because that is, of course, the desired effect, uh, but they, in of themselves, would not be able to replicate. Their primary purpose would be to transduce genetic material into a human cell. And in and, and general, that would be into the innate chromosome material of a human cell, examples being a blood cell, or for that matter, a blood stem cell, and there are other examples of that as well. Lentiviruses are, are, are most commonly used in the world of hematologic malignancy. This, uh, in the uh, lighter, in the sorry, in the darker green, um, is is what's been called here a gene editing complex. I think this is the future. It's not so much in current practice, but these are um, DNA nucleases, so enzymes that are introduced into a human or can be done within the laboratory uh, with cells being reintroduced into a human, where instead of introducing genet new genetic material by a virus, these are editing complexes that can actually, um, as if they were a razor, modify existing genes um, by removing or, ad uh, or adding critical parts of a gene. Um, what's attractive about this is it's independent of viruses, and the other attractive part of this is that it is so exact when you know what enzymes to, to cleave. And so I think that over the next decade or two, we'll be hearing a lot about gene editing complexes. Um, and for those of you who are involved in science or read the media, a great and very prominent example of gene editing is the CRISPR technology, um, which is a form of gene editing. So, so here is an example of a viral vector. So this is a standard virus. Let's assume this is a lentivirus. It has a, 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 a layer uh, outside that, that, that separates it from the outside world, a viral capsid protein. It has its own genetic material, and in the red is an example of a transgene, a gene that has been introduced into that virus. You use the rest of the machinery of the virus to get into a human cell and to allow that virus then to place the uh, genetic material, and this would be genetic material that you have intentionally uh, transduced into the virus, into the chromosome, chromosomal material of, uh, of the target uh, patient. And in this case, this would be a human patient. And then as that chromosomal material naturally produces its own proteins, you then have brand new protein, so-called transgenic protein, that has its own functions, hopefully a disease-altering function. So to use this terminology here as an example, this is the press of the World Health Organization, Office of Information. It was a press release. Gene therapy, cure for hemophilia may be only a few years away, say WHO experts. Now you can tell by the, by the vintage of this. This is actually a fax uh, lent to me by Dr. Le David Lillicrap, who is a hemophilia expert at Queen's University. Um, and so he kept this because he was, he was wowed by this announcement. And he kept it for... 24 years. And he sent this to me a few uh, days ago saying, hmm, be careful about announcements of renaissances because we seem to have had a renaissance in 1994, which incidentally was the year I finished medical school. And so there's been quite a lot of water under the bridge since 1994 and some, some more gray hairs. So, so, um, so what's changed? Why, why was there this, this very, very exciting announcement in 1994, and here we are in 2018, and we're saying, oh, well, gene therapy is now here. So, so, so this is, this, many of you have seen this, the Gartner hype cycle for gene therapy. And the Gartner hype cycle is applicable to anything we do, including, you know, getting ready for school in the morning, um, which, is, which is that, that you, you, you start with this, this technology trigger, 
for example, you know, the alarm that wakes you up. And, and then you're, you're very excited, and then you realize that you need to go to, to school. Uh, you're not going to the beach. And eventually there's an acceptance phase and some negotiation with your parents, and then you're off to school. And, and the same holds for many other examples. And here is the example for gene therapy. So there were massive and very important technological developments in the post-war period, particularly around the ability to introduce genetic material into mammalian cells, and then recombinant technology, which allowed us to move genetic materials in and out of a cell, um, so so-called so cutting and pasting. And so this is when a lot of discussion happened about, can you imagine if we can introduce cells or delete uh, genes to, to cure serious diseases? And so there was, there was lots of hype. And perhaps this was the first renaissance. And then there were issues around, we're just not doing very well with this technology. We introduce viruses, but the body, for example, has their own immune system that wards off that virus and kills it, um, as we are meant to do with viruses. So, in other words, immune reactions, um, and they were simply ineffective. Um, much more seriously with these two examples, back in 1999, uh, Jesse Gelsinger, the Jesse Gelsinger case uh, that arose in the U.S. This was a very young man in his 20s who volunteered for a scientific study of gene therapy for an enzyme deficiency of which he had a very mild version. Um, and by some overwhelming immune reaction to the infusion of this foreign material, um, he developed multi-organ failure and died rapidly. Um, and, and this really put a, a huge halt on much gene development during, during that stage there. Similarly, a few years later, after a series of experiments to treat children with inborn immune deficiencies, um, what had been found is that the genes that were chosen then to be transduced had implanted into parts of the human chromosome that um, uh, functioned effectively as oncogenes. And then a cohort of kids who were initially successfully treated for these immune deficiencies, they later developed acute leukemia uh, as a result of the new genetic material stimulating genes that were cancer-causing in the blood system. And so this was, was part of this disillusionment. And then with new vector development, including adapted lentiviruses and uh, adeno-associated viruses, um, things really started looking up again. We've now had clinical successes. We've now had very significant biopharma engagement as well. So there's very widespread interest in the development of these products as well as the marketing of these products. So, so we're, we're here now. Um, and there we are in 2017, end of 2017, another editorial uh, about gene therapy for hemophilia. And from the editorial, and this is where I borrowed the word renaissance, uh, Dr. Porteous mentioned another example of the gene therapy renaissance. And as we stand today, and I'm going to use an example of a renaissance man over here, um, there are plenty of treatments not necessarily related to oncology where there is either substantial promise and development about gene therapeutics or even licensed products ready for, for use. And so um, yeah. Treatments for inherited retinal dystrophy, pointing at the eye there. Uh, treatment for a childhood form of um, muscular paralysis called spinal muscular atrophy. Treatments for both hemophilia A and B, as well as a rare enzyme deficiency that leads to uh, abnormalities in the lipids of humans. Um, so these are examples where uh, gene uh, vectors are actually injected directly into patients, um, either into the bloodstream or into the organs of interest. So, for example, with the retinal treatments, the injection is into the eye. Um, and I've starred those that are either FDA-approved or European Medicines Agency approved. Um, then the uh, ex vivo example, my apologies for that typo, that should be ex vivo. In other words, cells are removed subjected to gene transduction and then returned to the patient, so outside of the patient. And here are two recent examples, treatment for a type of severe combined immune deficiency in uh, children called SCID, um, and that is EMA approved. Um, another form of degenerative uh, nerve condition uh, seen primarily in children, 
still under development. And then really I think the big ones in terms of their public health implications are malignancy, cancer. And, and really the, the, the great examples being leukemia and a, a related condition called lymphoma. And, and there are products now that are FDA approved in the U.S., for these malignant conditions. And I'll go through this in a little bit more. So, so what is CAR-T therapy? So CAR-T therapy is a form of gene therapy. And I have a slide that tries to explain um, uh, what this is. Hopefully the animation will work. Um, but what CAR-T therapy is, is a form of ex vivo, or outside of the human body gene therapy, where T cells are removed manipulated with the introduction of a new gene, usually via a lentivirus or a related virus, allow those T cells then to target a, th a malignant cell. Those cells are then reintroduced in the hope that those cells will do their work in circulation and target the malignant cell. So here's what I'm getting at. Lentivirus goes in, introduced into the T cell, Okay, sorry, it was it went far faster than my, my, my English and speech was to allow, so apologies for that. The process is probably a little bit slower than I just showed you. But um, I'll go through it a little bit here. So you've got a redirected T cell targeting a particular antigen. So here's the T cell. It's got its own receptors. This would be the T cell receptor that is primarily designed to target foreign tissue, particularly microbes such as viruses. But they're not very effective in their native state at targeting tumor cells. And tumor cells generally are able to bypass the natural T cell receptor. So instead what has happened is we've introduced via uh, new genetic material into the nucleus of the T cell a brand new receptor complex that has characteristics of the human T cell receptor in it. But the, but the working side of it is new and is able to target antigens or surface proteins that are expressed on a tumor cell, and in this example being a leukemia cell. And so by the introduction of this brand new product, which is an adapted form of an antibody, the business end of an antibody, those antibodies can then recognize the tumor antigen and they can be direct cell kill between the patient's own modified T cells and the tumor cell. Very elegant, and it allows direct kill of tumor cells. This is not a new concept, and in fact, these were the founders of it, and it's always fun going through the history of the initial publications. And so here is the seminal publication from mm, 20, almost 20 years ago. Um, uh, no, sorry, almost 30 years ago of um, a group of immunologists in Israel who had observed that if you could create these chimeric models, and chimeric really means a mixture, so it's a mixture of characteristics of the innate T cell receptor as well as newly introduced uh, material onto the end of that molecule, a chimera, um, as functional receptors with antibody type specificity. So they function as antibodies and therefore can recognize foreign materials such as tumor cells, or for that matter, um, in theory, an infection as well could be eradicated. And so the difficulty at this stage back in 1989 was ensuring that those lymphocytes were long lived. You could reintroduce them into a patient and they may kill off a few cancer cells, but they wouldn't stick around for very long. Uh, they would fatigue and die off. And then you'd be left with the patient's regular immune system and a risk of relapse. And what's been done over the last now uh, couple of decades is to ensure that that chimeric molecule, the new chimeric molecule, um, has enough uh, additional material on it to ensure that it gives off signals of the T cells to survive, to proliferate, and to give off uh, the right uh, chemical signals in the uh, patient for other cells to help in the destruction of that tumor cell. So that's what's led us to 2018. So they are now have been geared up to be much more effective uh, cells at treating malignancy. So 
Why are hematological malignancies at the forefront? Uh, in part because blood is very accessible and you can understand hematologic diseases much more easily than many solid tumors because the blood is available to us simply by getting blood from a vein. Um, and so we know that there are targets within the lymphocyte system that are expressed on malignant cells, but that fortunately are not expressed on the stem cells that produce those. And here's an example of an antigen or a surface marker on a malignant cell um, and on some normal B cells called CD19. So it's expressed on B cells, which are a type of lymphocyte. It's expressed by most B cell malignancies, and these are examples of them, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, acute lymphocytic leukemia. These are all lymphomas over here, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and that they express CD19 but stem cells are spared. Because if you were to introduce a chimeric antigen receptor T cell and it knocked off both the malignant cells expressing CD19 but also the stem cell, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Because stem cells would then be destroyed and that patient may then have blood and immunologic failure as a result. But if the stem cells are spared, they can do their own job at producing other important cells of the blood system and the immune system. And we are only then um, targeting malignant cells with CD19 and to some extent some mature B cells that also express CD19. So how do we do this? So I mentioned this is an ex vivo procedure so you need to get the cells out of the body first. So here's a patient. So let's assume that this is somebody with a substantial and significant malignancy such as lymphoma. By the process of something called leukophoresis which is basically a removal of a small number of T cells uh, from the body. And this is a very standard procedure offered widely throughout uh, most of the world, but especially North America, Europe, um, and other developed countries. This is a routinely available procedure stored in a bag. It is transported to a manufacturing facility. Um, and at that point, two very important things happen. The T cells are activated so that they're able to take up the new genetic material. Um, the new genetic material is introduced, and an ex this is an example of a lentivirus, so um, this is the transduction of the new genetic material. Um, they are expanded and purified, so large numbers of T cells have been able to reproduce, and they all should be bearing this brand new genetic material on their surface. And this is this ex vivo expansion. There is then chemotherapy given to the patient. And the chemotherapy is primarily to reduce the probability that any residual immune system in the, in the patient uh, rejects or modifies the newly incoming CAR T cells. So it's really a way of immune suppressing temporarily the patient so that they accept these cells and then that they are reinfused. Once they are reinfused, it effectively is, effectively is functioning as a living drug because they should be policing, circulating and policing particularly the blood, the bone marrow, the lymph nodes um, in the example of, of leukemias and lymphomas and eradicating cells. There is not also a fixed number of cells. Those cells um, should expand and proliferate both when they're still in the laboratory and later. And theoretically, at least, these should be very long-lived lymphocytes that could live for months and hopefully for, for years. So let's talk about some of the, the clinical outcomes and some of the potential downsides to this, because I'm sure as I've been speaking about this, you might think, well, what if? Um, so, okay, so I mentioned leukemia and lymphoma. So these statistics are courtesy of the Canadian Cancer Society and the Canadian Cancer Registry. So what's important is that they've looked at incidence by age group here. And as you can see, cancer is a, is a disease generally of older people. Um, and so you can see that the numbers are very, very high. These are raw numbers from the Canadian Cancer Registry. Um, but you can also see that the representation of specific and separate malignancies differ depending on how old you are. And within the pediatric group, so 0 to 14, you can see that leukemia is very highly represented. A third of 
malignancies in childhood is leukemia, and another 10 odd percent are lymphomas. So leukemia and lymphoma together constitute almost half of malignancies seen in childhood. So these may seem like rare malignancies in the grand scope of Canada, but in the world of enriching that and speaking about children and adolescents, these are very, very prominent and important diseases, especially if you factor in potential years of life lost um, with, a, with, with a, a child with a malignant disease as compared to somebody who acquires a disease um, such as a different malignancy in their very advanced years. Um, even in the slightly older age groups, lymphoma and leukemia are still there. So in the 15 to 29 group, you've got uh, leukemia and lymphoma constituting 12% of cases. Um, the other solid tumors become much more prominent as we get older, but they're there still, non-Hodgkin lymphoma over here and leukemia, even in um, people over the age of 85. So we see them in any age group. Um, now, what happens if you fail frontline treatment? So we have good treatments for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We have good treatments for leukemia. They're not always successful. And if you were to relapse beyond conventional types of treatment that are offered in Canada, there is generally trouble. Um, and so here's an example based on a cohort of lymphoma patients. This is published by a colleague in Toronto who said, well, if you, if you relapse, at best, if you relapse with a, with a, with a minimal amount of uh, active lymphoma, um, you could theoretically be in a disease-free or cured state in maybe 30-something percent of the time. But, but a large proportion of these do even worse. And this very advanced group here have, you know, at best 10% likelihood of long-term survival. And the same holds if you were to relapse with ALL as a child, so that the, the solid line is the number of people surviving after what is considered best treatment for relapsed acute leukemia. We're not doing a very good job. So there is definitely a sense that there's an unmet need for these diseases that can be treated well up front, but not necessarily if and when they relapse. So before I go to that, I want to talk about the, the, the what-ifs, the bad, the bad side of this current technology of CAR-T therapy. It's not all simple. And I want to talk about two specific adverse effects that have been very prominent and have been seen frequently. One is that when you reintroduce these lymphocytes, um, they are uh, already activated cells, and they will only become more activated when they're exposed to a tumor cell. And what happens is, they start proliferating, there are more of them. And they also, they, they release proteins called cytokines that promote inflammation in the body. And now there is a good term for it, which is the, upon reinfusion of these cells, there's a syndrome that's been described very frequently called a cytokine storm or a cytokine release syndrome. And it can do damage. Even if the tumor is being well treated by these new CAR T cells, the amount of side damage can be alarming and very serious and potentially fatal. Uh, fevers, fatigue, low blood pressure, uh, damage to critical organs. This tends to happen within the first two, two weeks. Um, there can be neurologic toxicity, possibly because these same cytokines or proteins get into the brain. And, and can cause some concerns, confusion, delirium, speech disturbances, even seizures. Not in everyone, but it is a significant concern. Those are the two most clinically prominent. Um, some of the other side effects, I mentioned that the CD19 cell is expressed on mature B cells. B cells are responsible for making antibodies, and antibodies are important in terms of fighting off infections, in terms of our responses to vaccines. So one of the downsides is that a lot of these uh, young adults who've exposed to the CAR-T anti-19 treatment has been left with absent healthy B cells as well, which means that they've needed to have uh, surveillance for infections. They may have lost their immunization, and it's hard to know whether they'll regain their uh, immunity to certain childhood vaccines, and they may need to have immunoglobulin replaced uh, over months or even years. Um, I mentioned the risk of uh, cancer-causing uh, complications from inserting new genetic material. This is really, I think, far less of a concern than it has been historically back in the 90s, but definitely something to watch for. Um, so I'm going to move on, though, just in, in terms of time, but be aware of these potential adverse effects.
So what, and there's some practicalities as well with CAR-T therapy. You need to be able to have a patient who can undergo the so-called leukophoresis. They need to be able to get a white cell collection done. Um, so you need to have a facility to do that. The patient needs to be able to withstand the, the, the procedure. It's relatively straightforward. Um, they also need to be reasonably well, and their disease, for example, leukemia, needs to be stable enough for that manufacturing ex vivo process to happen. That could be anywhere from two to four weeks. And there have been examples where people whose disease has relapsed in that short period. Not always, but it's possible. Um, I mentioned the cytokine release syndrome. I mentioned these other toxicities. So this treatment is unlikely to be for everyone. The patients who've, who've experienced this, this treatment so far have had some reserve in order to be able to tolerate treatments of this level of complexity and risk. And a big issue in recent years has been that these treatments have not been available everywhere, and there has been travel. And travel is disruptive and risky of its own, in, in of its own. Uh, people have had to travel to uh, across uh, international borders to get this treatment, or, 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 or at, uh, at least within Canada, across provincial borders. So I'm going to go briefly through the results of two very important studies that left, led to the FDA registration of two products in the last three to six months. So this was a pivotal study. It was a phase two study, which means a single arm, non-comparative study. And in this case, in a relatively small cohort of 75 patients who had acute lymphoblastic leukemia that had the CD19 signature on it. And these were predominantly children and some young adults. It was up to the age of 23 in the study. So they got the product that is, that is currently marketed by Novartis, uh, but developed at the uh, NIH. Um, excuse me, uh, um, developed at, uh, at Penn, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and they received their initial immune suppressive therapy. They got the cells back. And the results were, were I would say, quite phenomenally uh, heartening. Um, so their remission rates were at 81% at three months. The event-free survival, in other words, survival without any um, relapse, um, at one year was 50%. And overall, of these 75 patients, three quarters were alive at one year. So at least in comparison to our historical experience with children who were this heavily treated with relapse disease, this was, this was extraordinarily good. They saw lots of the cytokine release syndrome, 77% of patients. Um, they saw lots of neurologic toxicity. Almost half of the patients were managed on an intensive care unit, which is why I initially showed you a picture of the, van of the, uh, of the Winnipeg Health Sciences Center, because this is, sometimes this treatment is not always delivered by oncologists, Intensive care unit doctors become and teams become very important here. Three patients died as a result, directly as a result of the complication of this. They're not all rosy, but still results were good. There was a study recently presented that had equally uh, good outcomes in lymphoma patients. These were adults with lymphoma, heavily treated, relapsed lymphoma. These kind of patients would have not have a good prognosis. They received um, another product that has a somewhat different um, manufacturing makeup. Um, and in these heavily treated lymphoma patients, they, again, they saw really good response rates, remission rates of 82% at six months, and about almost two-thirds were alive at the one-year mark. Both had quite short-term follow-up. And they also saw the cytokine release syndrome frequently, although thankfully, um, not as many that required ICU care and required very, very substantial support. Um, nonetheless, two patients died directly as a result of the treatment. So very promising results, but it was these studies that really led to the FDA approval of the product for availability, at least within a limited number of centers in, uh, in North America. And here was the, the hype around the first product, the uh, CTL-019, which has got this amazing name, Tisagen Leclusol. Um, and and this, was a, this was a a patient who had successfully received the treatment, who was there advocating for the treatment directly at the FDA hearing last summer. Uh, Emily Whitehead, who, who's, who's, who's cured and, 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 and back at school as a result of this treatment. Um, and there's more products as well. So this is the Novartis product that I mentioned. 
the, the, the second product in lymphoma I've mentioned as well. There are others. There are other um, biotech companies that have partnered with many academic centers, primarily in the U.S., to develop these products um, uh, broadly. Um, a reminder that there have been some deaths as, uh, on treatment, and one product developed by Juno, a uh, biotech company in the U.S., uh, had to be pulled because of significant neurologic complications in there. So this is um, a reminder not all the products are alike, and um, not all are safe. So I'm just looking at the time here, and I think I'm going to skip because I want to talk a little bit about where Canada fits in. So this is where we are in terms of active clinical trials in the world of CAR-T. And this was a, by my review four days ago from clinicaltrials.gov that says there's lots of academic studies in this area. There's lots of pharma studies in this area. There's one randomized trial, one direct comparison against standard treatment. And this is in the patients with um, relapsed lymphoma. And it's really nice to see that somebody is going through that exercise of comparing CAR-T therapy directly against standard of care, rather than relying on historical controls. Um, and there's a mix of uh, evaluations in children and adults, and there's a sort of a new area of interest in, in solid tumors as well. In other words, moving outside of the domain of hematological malignancies. Um, and as you can see, by far the majority is, is, is in, is in science-rich and wealthy countries as well. The U.S., uh, China, Europe being very prominent, four centers have had clinical trials open for CAR-T therapy. These are primarily industry-sponsored trials um, in, in Canada. So, so what is Canada doing? Well, as I mentioned to you, we have a small number of stem cell or bone marrow transplant centers that are interested in uh, this that have signed up for sponsored uh, clinical trials, primarily based at blood and marrow transplant centers in Canada. And as per clinical trials, there are, there are four, four centers that are involved currently, which is relatively small. It's good to see that there are academic initiatives happening uh, in order to develop Canadian designed and made CAR-T products as well. And this is not something that we can, we need to exclusively borrow from the U.S. And I bring your particular attention to the GoCart program um, sponsored by BioCanRx uh, as it, with a collaboration from Ottawa and UBC. Um, and there is a, uh, the, an, a nascent and an early program being developed um, uh, at the Mars Center in Toronto as well, uh, although I'm not aware of any specific uh, plans that they have at this stage. Cellular therapy in Canada is very much based on the long-standing existence of blood and marrow transplant centers, and there are many across the country. Uh, it would be logical to me that blood and marrow transplant centers are the most equipped to deal with the processes of cell collection as well as the delivery of these potentially risky treatments. Um, and the good side of that is that both the Canadian Blood and Marrow Transplant Group as well as an international center out of the U.S. have registries so that we can track outcomes once these treatments become uh, a reality across the country. Um, cellular therapy oversight in Canada is, a, is, 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 is complex. Uh, it's not as predictable as drugs. And this is an example of how blood and marrow transplant centers um, function and who they report to. So Health Canada plays a a role in the the, the, pr the the safety of a cellular product, particularly they're particularly concerned about microbial contamination of products. Um, one match CBS is particularly involved in the health of unrelated donors in their core blood bank. Um, standards for transplant centers is actually overseen by an American organization called the Foundation for the Accreditation of Cellular Therapy, and it's my understanding that when it comes to the marketing of CAR T products. Those companies that market them will create a requirement that centers are fact accredited to deliver these, um, these products. And then the health technology assessment and the funding has very much been an issue that traditionally has been devolved to the provinces uh, and territories. Um, and that, that, to my knowledge, there hasn't been formal health technology assessment uh, and, and funding decisions at the, at the national level, uh, although, of course, um, yeah, I, I can't predict how that will work with CAR-T therapy. Um, 
So here's a conclusion that came from the Lancet, because they usually say things better than anyone else. Um, this remarkable technical advance is exciting progress in a disorder with few treatment options, using the acute leukemia example. But given the limited data supporting its use, the introduction of this drug should be seen as a first cautious step. Which I think is a good summary, although even between September and now, there have been more data that are very helpful about this. Um, so hopefully I've, I've run through these first three areas in the small amount of time that I've had, and that the larger discussion is, is up to all of us here. Um, and I do want to bring your thanks to two people who had given me advice and given me some lovely slides. Natasha Kekra, who is part of the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and has played a, a very important role in an attempt to develop products through the GoCart BioCanRx um, project here in, in Canada and particularly in Ottawa. And then Dr. David Lillicrap, who is really the country's foremost expert on, on hemophilia and hemophilia science, uh, who's based at Queen's University. So, so thank you to them as well. So we have a, a little bit of time for questions, and, and thank you very much, everyone. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Seftel. We now have about 15 minutes for questions, and I'm going to try to alternate between questions from those in the room here in Ottawa and those online. And just again, as a reminder to all participants, please identify yourself and the organization you represent before you ask your question. So I'm looking to the audience here uh, in Ottawa and wondering if there might be a question from the crowd. Yes, please go right ahead. Um, okay, uh, my name is Sofia Tabularis, and I'm associated with Myeloma Cancer Research Net Network, but I'm a cancer patient myself. Um, and my question is, uh, you didn't mention about myeloma and the CAR T cell therapy in that, and also if you can a little bit talk about the dual using BCMA and CD19 both as a target for the, the it's a recent article in blood. So how is that work? And how they can control the uh, cytokine release syndrome to reduce the effect? You ask very good questions. Um, in, in, and I'd, I'd love to answer them, and I would have liked to have included that, although within the limits of time, what I tried to focus on were the diseases that were really at the forefront of scientific development so far. But just a point about myeloma, which is a, effectively a subtype of the lymphoma group, it's also a B-cell disorder, does not bear um, all the same characteristics as the lymphomas, and you're absolutely correct. As a target, in much the same way that CD19 is a target, a different protein target by the name of BCMA has been identified as a very, very promising target in myeloma. And there are um, uh, clinical trials in, in active accrual in myeloma, which is another very important disease in the world of blood cancers, um, that may respond equally as well to the treatments that I've uh, I've listed for the acute leukemias and the and the lymphomas. In terms of future development, um, you're absolutely right. I mentioned that uh, we're looking at gene editing, perhaps in the future of gene therapy for malignancies and others. Uh, targeting two surface proteins at once, absolutely. So CD19 and BCMA together, CD19 and CD22 together, etc. Those are all part of future development, not quite upon us in terms of making decisions about access to treatment right now, definitely within the realm of, of clinical trials. Because you bring that up, I just wanted to mention that in terms of the toxicities, you can either manage the toxicity by suppressing the immune response, particularly um, clamping down on, the, on these, these, these abnormal proteins or cytokines that have been released. And there are good treatments for that now, including a drug called tocilizumab, which blocks interleukin-6. Uh, but more importantly is if you think things have gotten out of control, perhaps later on, how do you turn that gene off? And so there are attempts to develop uh, treat, um, uh, CAR-T therapies that have a switch on them. 
that allow us, for example, six to 12 months later saying, right, you've done your work, let's switch that gene off. Um, that can either be done by introducing new drugs that target those cells or by gene editing uh, complexes. Not quite ready for prime time, but, but all very, very important questions. Great. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to go through the questions that are coming in online, but perhaps in the, allowing me some time to go through these questions, perhaps I could check again in the audience. I know that there's someone down my row who really wishes to ask a question. Go right ahead. Hi, Dr. Seftal. Great, great presentation. Brian O'Rourke from Cadeth. Uh, you referenced this as a drug and also a manufacturing process and a clinical delivery system. I wonder if you might speak a little bit to some of the work that the BioCan RX uh, are doing, and perhaps in other countries as well, at looking at their own type of vector delivery or manufacturing processes. Right. So, so I think I think what's nice about BioCan RX, in addition to the fact that it is is a, a Canadian-grown concept, is that um, they're trying to develop a product, but at the same time they're tr trying to establish. Um, that there is enough interest and need in this country to develop a new product, uh, including surveys of patients um, and other clinical and policy stakeholders to say, how would you feel if there, was a, if there was a Canadian product that became available and would you use it, would you want to accrue into trials of this sort? But at the same time, um, they've had those within the laboratory side and the basic side, particularly those at UBC and, um, and the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, who have embarked on a process of ensuring that their ability to uh, manufacture lentiviruses is up to standard, um, using good laboratory processes and good manufacturing processes, that they are then able to transduce them effectively into T cells and to purify, purify the T cells appropriately. That's all happening at once. And hopefully, there will be a coincidence at the end of those two procedures to know that they are ready to launch a clinical trial, um, which my understanding is, is hoped for the end of 2018, is to have a, uh, a small um, single-arm trial to develop this product. Probably the, 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 the easiest way to call it is a product now, because I don't know if it truly can be defined as a drug. It's an adapted uh, cell product. Uh, that said, the likelihood is that it is most likely will supplant currently available drug-related treatments for many of these malignancies. You've heard about leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma, where the mainstay of treatments and the mainstay of expense for these treatments has been drug-related. Um, it would be lovely to think that CAR-T therapy, once it's proven to be highly effective, with long-term follow-up, could theoretically replace pharmacotherapy for many of these, uh, these diseases. So my personal opinion is I, I like to think of it as a drug, even though the manufacturing process is somewhat different. Great. Um, so we're getting, again, a number of questions coming in from our online audience. And I'm just uh, continuing on from that previous line of questioning. Here's a question from uh, the BC Cancer Agency. And the question is, is the emphasis in assessments and approvals on products or on processes? Could procedure and funding approval be given almost in an umbrella format? Is that what you're seeing, what you're hearing, um, given our current system, which does tend to be siloed with a drug budget and everything else coming from somewhere, someone else's budget? Tough one. Um, a, a, a very tough one, um, and perhaps going back to the example of the BioCan RX product, is that I think that they like the idea of having this approved, you know, initially through Health Canada and through other regu regulatory agencies as a, as a comprehensive product that includes uh, approval and certification of their manufacturing processes as well as their clinical trial and ultimately their clinical trial results. Um, seeing it uh, approved in, in components and parts is, is, is cumbersome, um, but using the example of the, 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 the most prominent CAR-T product, the, the uh, Tissen Gen Leclocel, is that really it is, it is approved, to use an example, by the FDA 
but it's not approved as a product. It's approved as a product for children and young adults with acute leukemia. Uh, because at least until products become considerably safer and with much longer term follow-up, I do think that being restrictive about its clinical indications is as important as approving the, the production elements of it. I, I'm squirming out of that question that came from the BC Cancer Agency because you asked a very difficult one. But I do think it's, this is a question that has to be asked again and again, perhaps with other parties in, 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 in the room as well. So now it's time to come back to the room here in Ottawa. There has to be a question here. Michael, would you like to? Why not? Michael Wolfson, University of Ottawa. Simple question. How much do these therapies cost or these products? And uh, it, what are your expectations? You know, a lot of these things are declining in cost over time. So for the yeah. next decade, say? It's a, such an important question. I did mention that I talk about the economics of it and, and, and only really paid it lip service. But um, the, 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 the current products which are marketed in the U.S., so that we only have an inkling of what they are costing in the U.S. environment. And I don't think we know what they're going to cost um, once these become commercially available in Canada. But currently, the cost of the product as a whole, so you know, you've, you, you've, you've done the leukophoresis, you hand it off, then there's this you know, two to four week manufacturing process and then you get this product back to you um, is in the region of several hundred thousand dollars. And I've heard estimates that range from somewhere around three to 500,000 US dollars. Part of that rather alarming expense is partly because this is a living drug. It doesn't need to get dosed daily. Once it's in, it's in. And um, if you were to compare it to potential alternative treatments that don't see as much cost up front, but see the cost of maintenance treatments and other long-term supportive care, uh, I suspect that is partly why it has been priced at those rather high levels. Um, how much it truly costs would be very interesting. I think it's a challenge to the BioCanRx people to say, well, what, in, the, in the absence of commercial development, what would it cost? And I'd like to think that that should be a role of a Canadian product to say, well, actually, the true cost is this. Um, which hopefully will be lower than that. Now, bear in mind the comparator is sometimes other forms of blood and marrow transplantation. In other words, is $500,000 a lot or a little when you compare it to the burden and cost of a transplant? And transplants are complicated procedures that in of themselves cost a lot of money. They cost the province's money. They cost humans and people out-of-pocket costs as well. And it wouldn't surprise me that a very complicated allogeneic transplant could reach $500,000 or more within the first one to two years of, of treatment. Whatever this is, this is a, a, a potentially a big burden on taxpayers and individuals. So I'm just cognizant that the clock in front of me has turned to three o'clock, uh, which means that we are out of time. So I want you to join me in giving a very big thank you to Dr. Matthew Seftel for his insights into gene therapy and CAR T. Thanks also to everyone uh, who joined us online for today's lecture. And of course, being an evidence uh, organization, we will be looking for evidence as to uh, the, uh, your uh, feelings about this particular lecture and uh, in terms of what topics you'd like to see in the future. So we will be sending out a feedback survey shortly. For those of you on site in Ottawa, you'll have a chance to chat with Dr. Seftel at the coffee reception we're holding just outside this room. And finally, uh, just a few reminders for everyone. I'm going to switch mics now. <laughs> Uh, the CATA Symposium will be held in Halifax on April 15th to 17th, and registration is now open. And it's a really big year for HTA in Canada because in early June, the annual meeting of the International Society for Health Technology Assessment, that is HTAI, will be holding its annual meeting in Vancouver. The CATA Lecture Series will resume in April when we host some webinars live from the CATA Symposium. Thanks again, everyone.